Um, Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to dedicate this class to our um, very special and wonderful friends, Chaya Yehudis Gittel Basmirim Devora, and today was her Levaya, and I think we're all um, still kind of reeling. Like I don't know if I know for sure for me, like I'm I can't digest it. Okay, so I was like very close to her. I think for the last ten years, like she was a real, real element in my life and in all of our lives. And I really do feel that, you know, all of us helped her to become the person that she became. And she helped us, you know, as much, you know what I mean? For her becoming that person closer to Hashem, she definitely helped us become closer to Hashem, especially in her, um, I would say, like, this was probably her hardest year, and especially the last six months. And I think it was in her merit that a lot of us, you know, took on Tehillim and took on different mitzvahs. And I think that um, we learned to appreciate what it meant to give people attention and to smile and to like give you a hug that meant more than a hug. It meant I totally love you, you know? So I'm going to start, I'm going to try not to cry, but she, what's it called this? So she really brought out, I think she brought out the best in us. Like if we had to really think about it as a community and even as individuals, she totally, totally brought out the best in us. So um, I want to talk about uh, this fast day and the time period that we're actually heading in. So, cause I was thinking about it, like the fast is over at 931 and we're going to be talking about it at 806. Okay. So, you know, it seems kind of odd, but it's not odd because Shiva Thomas really is the beginning of a time period called the three weeks that ends with Tisha B'Av. And it's not an easy time period in Jewish history. It's not an easy time period for us in general, but it really is a time period, I think, that is here to make us stop and to think. You know, and I think uh, that's something that's hard for us to do. It's really hard for us to take life in some ways seriously. It's a very busy place. We're always running. We're always this thing. We're always that thing. We're kind of avoiding a lot of introspection of real introspection and I just think it's the nature of the beast I feel like people are really not that comfortable necessarily thinking about who they are and where are they going and you know like I think we try to fill our time a lot with stuff that distracts us right and then comes a fast day and the fast day sort of tells you like uh, sorry okay <laughs> time for you to think. So the question is like, what should we be thinking about? So I just want to bring you a little bit of an overview. So this day, Shivasar Batamus, there were five very great tragedies that happened. And I'm going to read some of them. So one was Moses broke the tablets at Mount Sinai. And why would he do that? Does anybody remember why? Why did he break those tablets at Mount Sinai? Who remembers? You can hold this up. Yes, why, why? Because of the golden calf, okay? So here it was, you know, he comes down with these beautiful tablets right after the Jewish people, you know, have this one-on-one -on -one with Hashem and it's gonna be this new era and I'll explain that in more detail. And he comes down and Hashem sees, okay, actually Hashem says, go down. And you will see that the Jewish people are worshiping an idol right now and dancing around a golden calf. So we can see that that would be a big one. The daily offerings in the first temple were suspended during the siege of Jerusalem after the Kohanim could no longer obtain animals. So that daily offering was called the Korban Tamid. And what was so special about the Korban Tamid, you can actually say a prayer in the mornings, every morning that takes place, that takes the place of the Korban Tamid. And the Korban Tamid was the Korban that forgave the Jewish people. So it forgave you for the morning and it forgave you in the evening. So it was like a... And that's a beautiful um, reality right there. Okay, now three, the Jerusalem's walls were breached prior to the destruction of the second, second temple. Fourth, prior to the great revolt, the Roman general Apostomus burnt a Torah school, setting a precedent for the horrifying burning of Jewish books throughout the centuries, right? So we have to understand and appreciate like not long ago, Hitler burned all the books and the shuls and the Jewish people Nebuch at the same time. An adulterous image was placed in the sanctuary of the Holy Temple, which was a brazen act. Can you hear me? I hope so. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, is anything cracking up? Because I'm hearing a lot. Yeah, of yeah, there's the, like a muddling. I'm getting a muddling. Mm -hmm. Where that would be coming from, because it was interesting. Okay, it was interesting. I can you mute everyone, everyone again? Gail? Yeah, let me yeah. See mute everybody. Try to mute everyone. Okay, and let's see. Okay, can you still hear me? Yeah, okay, good, yes. okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Okay, and then the, the last thing is this adulterous image, idolatrous, not adulterous, an idolatrous image is placed in the sanctuary of the Holy Temple, which is a brazen act. Now, it's very interesting. A lot of these realities set a precedent for the future. Like we said with the burning of the books is the burning of the Torah school. And this idea of the blasphemy and desecration in the sanctuary of the Holy Temple is this very unfortunate. Um, Menashe was a Jewish king who actually placed an Avodah Zarah in the temple of the, in the Holy Temple. So sometimes like we as Jews, like we start to bring in all these like foreign ideas and foreign concepts and we put them into the shul. Do you know what I mean? We're like, you know, dance parties and things like this, like they don't really belong in a shul or ideas that are completely foreign to what Judaism really means. So it's just interesting how you can see like these little breaches can open up something altogether different. So what's going on here is we're starting the, what we call the three weeks. And when we start these three weeks, we start already to feel a little bit of trepidation. Okay, so the trepidation should not only come from like, oh my gosh, Tisha B'Av's coming and, and, and we're mourning and, and you know, you shouldn't be going to a court case now. Like it's, it's almost like bad muzzle. You know what I mean? You shouldn't be listening to music and you should be growing, a, you know, like for men, they should shave and can't shave and they grow their beards and we're not supposed to be saying a Shechi Anu and all of these things, right? And people don't have weddings because they can't have the music, all of this stuff, right, until after Tisha B'Av. So the trepidation that we really should be feeling is not only that, like, physically things are becoming very uncomfortable, but the trepidation is, like, why? You know, why? What happened in history? What's going on? What can we do to make a difference? What is this all about? And I think that that's a very important reality. Like, this is really a good time of year to actually sit down and ask yourself, like, do you have any breaches, anything broken in the relationship that you have, even between you and yourself, between you and the people around you, between you and Hashem, like any holes in the wall, you know, any like people that you're not doing well with, anything you're not liking about yourself, anything that you're down about, like it's, it's a good time to actually start to fill in these holes, right? How you're feeling with Hashem, like when these kinds of things happen, right? Like this happening to Jody, and it, it really impacts on us. It does. And tragedy impacts on us. And times that are mournful impact on us. And we need to like stop and think, you know, what are we feeling, right? How are we going to work with this? So fast days are not just about kicking your metabolism and getting a chance to lose some weight. And then, you know, you're thinking, okay, now I fasted. So now I'm going to be really good the rest of the week. <laughs> okay. So it's not just about those kinds of realities. It actually has a purpose, right? So let's try to think for a minute when you're fasting and you have this moment to think and fasting is about feeling hungry right? Anybody? I'm like really feeling hungry because it's 8.13, like we're getting near the end here. Okay, so when you are feeling hungry, right? So what kinds of thoughts on a more deeper level, besides I wish I had something to eat, okay? Besides that physical reality, what does hunger make you start to realize? Anybody want to try to answer that question? What is feeling hungry? Like it's, it's, there's some reality here. Shem is not just doing this like Nah, 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 nah. Like there's a reason. Like, why does Hashem want you to feel hungry? What is it supposed to open up in your mind? Any ideas? We have such smart women. You have to have ideas. I know you guys. So we so are maybe, aware. You know what? Maybe we'll have a little hand come up and it will be so mm -hmm. cute. Okay, so Kathy. So to make you realize that something is missing. Something is missing, obviously food, but maybe 
to take it higher. Something's missing from your life. <clears throat> Maybe, yeah, that's good. What do we say? We say it's, it's very interesting because eating is what keeps the soul and the body together. Do you know that? Like eating is really supposed to be a very holy act, right? It's what keeps the body and soul together. So you're realizing maybe something's missing. Something's missing here. Okay, so Janet. Janet, I see a hand. Did you want to say something? Sorry, I had to unmute. Okay, um, no. per perhaps that we, how fortunate we are that we normally don't have to feel this hunger. And this is, I don't know, symbolic of. Yeah. Okay. That was great. Okay. So that's a very important part. Like, I think right now we are so blessed. We're living in very blessed times. I was talking to one of my daughters and she's saying that she can't find a camp for her son, you know, so I'm saying, so why don't you just send him to one of those like little rinky dinky camps? And she said, rinky dinky camps don't cut it anymore. Like kids have so much that when you try to send them to these, like, you know, they're an older grade and you try to send them to a backyard camp they're like uh this isn't like it's boring <laughs> so kind of like when you have a lot like do, does any of us ever think about going hungry no you think about like i wanted like you know sushi with the um with the uh, fish in it and they only had sushi with cucumber <laughs> like, you know, like what you know, that's what you're upset about. You're not upset about this concept like you ever think about going hungry. You never really think about like, wow, thank you, Hashem. You really do provide me with food every day, right? This isn't a simple story. I guess Hashem's kind of going like, excuse me, right? So Hashem, you provide me with food every day and I don't always remember to say thank you. And then when you start thinking about that, then maybe you start thinking about it and you provide me with health and you provide me with this and you provide me with that. And I have life and I have opportunity. And I have so many other things, right? And really I am blessed. I am so blessed, right? These are the kinds of ideas. And what about this one? What about another one? What about... I'm very blessed, but maybe there's other people out there that feel hungry. Yeah. yeah. That feel hungry more often. Like I only thank Hashem a million times. <clears throat> I only feel hungry when there's a fast day. <laughs> you know? but otherwise, I know Bar Hashem suffer from that issue at all. Right. So maybe it's another thing that Hashem wants us to think about. Right. And maybe he sometimes wants us to think about the reality that like he's really the one giving you the food. Like we really take it for granted. Like it's just me going to Sobeys. I think the world's having a real shakeup in general right now. You know what I mean? Like baby shortages of baby formula. I'm looking around all the time for this margarine that I loved. It's not on the shelf anymore. You know, and it's like a funny feeling. So sometimes like a fast day is there to kind of remind you, like, wait a minute, I got to be like, rethinking this because one thing we all know as parents right when kids don't appreciate do we give them more and more and more and more no so why not why don't you like so what so like, like that was the discussion we were thinking me and my daughter today like what should we do with this little boy because the truth is it's true it's boring those kind of camps nobody does this anymore who does backyard camps when you're in grade such and such but the problem was that the kid can't go to sleepover camp they don't have the, necessarily the funds and really he didn't really earn it in any special way right so if she just keeps giving him everything then what's going to happen with this attitude of this isn't good enough and this isn't good enough? What's going to happen? Ungratefulness. Yes, ungratefulness is only going to increase. So like Hashem is trying to tell us something like, wow. Think about all the things you have to be grateful for. It's really, really incredible. Okay. And think about it now before you have to lose it to realize what you had. I don't want to have to lose it. I don't know about you. I really don't want, I don't want the world to have to lose anything. I really don't. Like, let's just turn around now. That's what the fast day is all about, right? A fast day. Once you start thinking about these thoughts, then it starts to make you want to do what? Anybody know? Right? 
you start thinking about how ungrateful, like you suddenly realize, gee, I guess I wasn't that grateful. Now it makes you want to be grateful. Someone grateful. else, right. And someone else wrote our responsibility to help those people who are suffering. Like suddenly you want to reach out, you want to think, you want to become better, teshuva, you want to repent. That's what this is all about. This is all about these three weeks and all this. It's not just about suffering and getting us to go, oh, this is so bad and I can't go on my pinky and I want to go on this and I want to do that, right? Right? Mm. It's about like making us stop and think and, and, and appreciate what we do have and all the blessings and how can we make this world better and how can we, you know, change things and, and make it a, the place that we want to be and be the place and be the person that we want to be. Okay. So all very important. So it can increase your, you know, willingness to give chuva. It can cr increase this idea of not taking things for granted. All of this can come about. Okay. So now, Let's go for a trip in time, okay? Let's go for a trip in time. We're gonna go all the way back to Gun Aiden. We're gonna go back to Gun Aiden because you know, I think we need to all come to terms with like, why don't we appreciate and what's going on, right? Why are we in this mess, okay? <laughs> I think it's important to take a look at it. Okay, so let's go. So we say, what happens? Hashem creates Adam and Eve and he puts them in this beautiful garden and there's nobody else there. Like that's what's an interesting idea. You know, there isn't like all these hundreds of communities and there isn't internet and there isn't all this other stuff to keep you know distracting you there's only Adam and Chava and this real closeness to Hashem if you think about it and he puts them in this gorgeous gorgeous incredible place and he tells them you can eat from all of these trees right except for this one in the middle the Eitz Hadas right the tree of knowledge of good and evil you know what's really funny like do you ever ask yourself this like when Hashem says you can eat from all of these trees you never hear that Adam says, why me? Why am I so special that I get the gift of eating from all of these trees? Isn't that an interesting idea? But there's nobody else other than Eve. Yeah, but why not ask? Why not ask? You know, every one of us are blessed in a million ways. Like really, if you stop and you think of it, do you ever ask yourself, why me am I blessed? Why me, Hashem? Why did you give me this great community? Why did you give me Jody as a friend? Why did you give me this? Did anybody ever ask that question? Such a nice idea. Good. Okay. I love you, Debbie. Debbie's going, I did ask. <laughs> But that's a really good way to look at things. You know, sometimes like you get your simcha and you don't like really think like, why me? Why was I blessed with this? Why did my kids get married where other people's kids are not getting married? How grateful can I be to you, Hashem? Right? How did I have healthy children while other people I know didn't? Wow, well, why me? You know, so you don't hear that from Adam Arishon either. You don't hear, why can I eat from all these other trees? Oh, I can't eat from that one big spritz. I got a thousand other ones to choose from. So interesting. So what happens? Hashem gives him just how many mitzvahs? One. <laughs> okay. One mitzvah. One mitzvah. What was it? Don't eat. That was his one mitzvah. One mitzvah, don't eat from that tree of knowledge. And be, one mitzvah, lo say one mitzvah you can't do, one mitzvah you can do. I'm giving you permission, go, go, go eat, enjoy, have everything you want, just this one you can't have. And it's very interesting because it's between the, the it was the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. What's wrong with having that knowledge? Like, wouldn't you think that that, I mean, I, knowledge of good and bad like that is stupendous that's incredible why could you not have the knowledge of good and bad and you know what the Torah tells you which is really phenomenal had he not eaten from it right I think Shabbos would have come in and Hashem would we would have come into this world of Olam Haba everything would have been done and finished and Hashem would have said now you can eat from the tree of knowledge of good and bad so why could he not eat from it then because I'm going to tell you something that's really scary that is so important for all of us okay and what is so important for all of us that for us to know what's good and bad is to know one thing Hashem knows 
and we don't. That's all it is. That is the knowledge of good and bad. That's it. Hashem said, all those thousands of trees, they're good for you. This one is bad. Why? Because I said so. Doesn't sound great, you know, but we say it to our kids all the time. And you don't like saying it, but why do you say it? Because you know they couldn't understand the depth of why. I always say this, like with the cavities. You're going to sit there and tell your three-year-old why they're going to get cavities. They don't know what you're talking about. Okay? So in the end of the story, Hashem says, I'm going to give you the knowledge of good and bad. It's whatever I say, because I am God. And you are not. And that's it. And I am the creator and I know that the, all of history from here and there and I know who your soul is and I know where you came from and I know all the workings of the most intricate things from the from a little lice right to a giant rhinoceros I feed them every single day I'm the one who keeps the world moving and going and this and that so guess what you're gonna have to trust me and when I tell you that I understand it and I get it then once you can accept that I'm the one who knows what's good and bad, you will know what's good and bad. Could you imagine? Because I will tell you, may not look good, may not feel good, may not even smell good. Sometimes you have to take medication and it smells horrible. Okay, today everybody's much luckier. Who remembers when you were young what medication tasted like? right? They didn't have banana flavor, sweetie, you know, grape juice, okay? You, I, was, I remember throwing up from it. It was so bad, right? Like, it didn't taste good, okay? It didn't look good, all right? But did the doctor know what he was doing? Yes. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So sometimes that's what we're going to have to know. How do we know what's good and bad? Hashem tells us. That's the answer. Finish. Not even so hard anymore. It's amazing. That's what the message was. And once you have that bitachon, then what? Then you can fly. So when you look at Jody, who never you saw suffer every day, and whose body slowly but surely betrayed her. Right? What would she say? She yeah. never complained. Never. She never complained. She yeah. just said, thank God, thank yeah. God. Thank all day long. Like, you know, she'd read the thank you prayer. We'd all be like, Ugh! and she'd be like reading it and meaning it. Why? Because in the end, she said, who really knows what's good and bad? Only Hashem. And that was an amazing bracha. Like I was thinking about her today. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm not telling you this for the sake of telling you this, but I did the Chavar Kedisha for her this morning. Like I, I made it my business. Like I was gonna, I told her that before I took her, when, when I went, to, I took her, um, you know, to prearrange her funeral six months ago. Like it was, High Lifeline said we had to do it. Like High Lifeline said, you do these things now when you're very coherent. And it was very smart. I have to tell you, it was the smartest thing we did. And when we went, we were joking around. Like it was like that, you know, kind of dark humor. Like, are you kidding? And which kind of coffin do you want? You know, it was like just a joke. Okay, it was like, because no one really, you don't believe it's really gonna happen. But I told her, I'm gonna do a full service. I'm going to do a full service for you. Like, I will do your Chavar Kedisha. And she went like a princess. She went like a princess. I just want you to know she went like a princess. Okay? And we have to appreciate that. Because you look at the story, and it is very, very tragic. I'm not going to limit the tragedy. But we live on a different plane. Right? Just like all of these days are trying to teach us. Right? They look very dark. There's a lot of potential here. There's a lot of greatness here. And the Jewish people are beyond anything that exists in this world. Even the way we say goodbye to the body is beyond anything. I just want you to know. So she went like a princess. She was in her tachrichim like a princess. She was a princess. I'm going to tell you that now. 
So she understood this, she understood this, and it's something that we need to understand too. And it takes a lot of humility, a lot of humility, because it's hard to see a bigger picture, right? It's hard to see a bigger picture, but it's the difference between really honestly, real life and real death. That's what real bitachon is, because you could be the walking dead, and you could be very alive after death and alive in this world. So we need to appreciate that. How do you get it? It's through this bitachon. And that's where I think we have to understand and appreciate. Now we have to look at this reality in our lives, all right? Wherever there is potential for incredible greatness, there is always going to be potential for fall. Why is that? Why does Hashem have to do that? It seems like such a meanie mo. Why is there always potential? <laughs> like where there's going to be greatness and you can make wonderful choices. You can also make what? Bad choices. Yeah, bad choices. So why? Why does Hashem do that? Why can't he just give us a break? Because he's given us the, he's told us we are to choose. Right. We must go the right way or we can go the wrong way. Right, which is incredible. In other words, Hashem gives you free will choice. You get to be the creator of yourself. Nothing is greater than that. If Hashem made you a robot, then it would all be useless and mindless. It would be nothing. So like this, you can be, that's what I'm saying. This, this is what I mean by she went like a princess. She chose to be a princess, a Jewish princess. That's how she, okay, right? So wherever there is potential for this greatness, there's potential for this incredible darkness. So we just need to appreciate that as we go through these stories, because that's the story with Adam Harishon. There was this potential, not just for Adam himself. He's the father of mankind, okay? This, we're talking about the mother and father, the, the forerunners of mankind. So now mankind has fallen. Okay, so mankind could have had this utopian existence, right? They would have proven themselves. We're ready to believe you, Hashem. We're going to follow you into the dark and into the light and wherever you send us. Great. So all of mankind falls. Then a wonderful person comes along, Avram Avinu, who connects himself to Hashem and gives birth to the Jewish family, right? Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. And then they're going to turn into this nation. And as this nation right? Like whenever you study history, it's exactly what Hashem said. You will be a light onto the world. The world will revolve around you, right? Everybody who's, you know, from Westmount, who's going to hear my husband's class, like you almost could faint how much the world is revolving around the Jewish people. There's no doubt about it, right? People laugh when they look on the maps and they see Israel is like less than New Jersey and the whole world is, you know, revolving around. Israel invented the cell phone, okay? Big enough. <laughs> All right, so just think about that, okay? So what happens? The Jews go down to Mitzrayim, and for 210 years, they're there, right? And it becomes a mess because they assimilate, and they try to be like the Mitzrayim. So now they're put into slavery, and now Hashem says, you suffered a lot. For all of your suffering, I'm going to take you out right? For your choices, I will take you out. You will believe in me. Like guys, like think about this. Imagine living in somewhere for 210 years. And yes, it's terrible slavery, but then you're all emancipated and you're about to make a lot of money. Okay. And you're used to living here. Okay. Right. Let's say you're like, you know, you're used to living here and now you're in Lakewood. Okay. <laughs> you have everything you ever wanted. You know, like you talk to people who lived in Lakewood and they come here, they crack up. You know, I remember this uh, girl that I trained told me she lives in Lakewood. You walk into Lakewood, you say, can I have a pizza? And there it is. She said she came to Toronto. Her kids are starving. She goes, no big deal. I'll go to the pizza store in Toronto. Go to the pizza store. You say, I want a pizza. What do they say? Wait half an hour. Okay. <laughs> so she was like, what? <laughs> All right. So, okay. So now the world has changed. Right. And Hashem is here and he's amazing, but he emancipated you and he gave you everything you wanted. And now he's going to tell you, excuse me, how about you come with me into a desert? How many of us are really going to go? Not many, because not many went. Okay. So what the Torah tell you, as these people started to work their way up, you know, spiritually from the 50th, almost 50th level of Tumah, 
to being able to get to Harsinai, they were correcting the world. Okay, this was an opportunity for Mashiach. You know how we sit here all day and go, we wish it was Mashiach, we wish Mashiach would come. Mashiach, who was the Mashiach? Moshe Rabbeinu, okay? Had the Jewish people at that point in time, after they stood at Har Sinai and were able to hear Hashem and said, Naseh Nishma and said, we will take the Torah. And even me, I always tell people, I was a nice Orthodox girl in Cleveland in Notre Dame in a nice Catholic college full of nuns. And I opened my humanities book and they write in a Catholic college, they do not love Jewish people. And they write that the Jews brought the 10 commandments and morality to the world then it was an historical change for the entire world that cannot be denied because they've denied everything else but, okay? So here would have been mankind doing a tikkun, okay? This would have been a time of tikkun and Moshe would have brought the Jewish people into Israel forever and there would be no more death and there would be no more sickness and there would be no more, you know, um, misinformation and doubt it would have been a world of clarity and peace for the entire universe as we knew it right and what do the jewish people do what happens what they happens? bring down the golden calf yeah they do the golden calf and hashem says oh my gosh moshe go down and what did it mean go down you won't be able to be the mashiach we won't be able to bring this final reality to the world. So when we stop on today, on Shivas or Batamus, and we say that the luchos were broken, that's what was broken. That potential, that moment in time broke this reality of the tikkun of this world, bringing us back to the point where we just would have said, okay, Hashem, you tell us what's good and bad. And we trust you. So you can see that this really was an incredible, incredible tragedy, okay? Now, let me see what else I wanted to tell you, okay? You know, what's so interesting is that this could have been a new global order. So I don't know if you understand what's going on today in the world. Like I find this very fascinating and it must be what Hashem has in charge, what has Hashem has planned. Because like there is always a very negative force, then there has to be a very positive force. So today the underbelly of the world is looking for something called the new world order. Do people know this? And they're looking for a global new world, politically and economically. Does everybody know this? Where everybody shares the exact same value system, right? Which is a very liberal value system where God is not in the picture, where there's one unifying force of money going back and forth and one political reality that tells us all how to live. So interesting, no? Ooh. Right? So that would be the negative potential. So very obviously positive. there must be a very positive potential for a new world order because this concept of olam haba is a new world order to come. Do you see what's going on? So there's no coincidences in the time periods of history and what's happening. So we as the Jewish people and we as our own individual Jewish self, we can really impact very positively. That's something also that you can be thinking about. You could be thinking about that today and tomorrow. And it was very interesting, you know, when, when I, whoever was at the Leviah today, like Jody did say to me, like we went, when we went to do the Leviah six months ago, the question was, would it be graveside or in a, in a you know, in a um, chapel. chapel? Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> would it be graveside or in a chapel? So what was the question? Well, if it was COVID, we would have had no choice. It would have been graveside. And she turned to me, Jody, and she said, I really hope I get to have it in the chapel. 
I really want all my friends there. And I want my parents to see how much I was able to be connected to people. Because when she was born, she was born with epilepsy. And really there was a doctor who told them like, don't even bring her home. Don't bring her home from the hospital because what's gonna be with this kid is just gonna be horrifying. They literally said that to her, to their mom, to her mother. So here she was like, and they called me last night. I was, I was so funny. They called me last night. They were asking me, how many people do you think will be at the Levaya? And I, I, I said, well, how many chairs does it have? <laughs> okay, how many chairs in the jackal? That's how many chairs you're going to see filled. And Baruch Hashem, that's what we saw. So here's what I'm trying to tell you, like new world order. And you think to yourself, oh my gosh, how am I going to change? How's anything going to happen? The world's going to come crashing. It's going to be another tissue of it. No, no. Just like there's all this potential for the darkness, there's all this potential for the good. And if you take a look, all of these things that we're talking about, it's a breach. Hashem says it broke. It was a breach. It doesn't say it was destroyed and smashed. It says just a little crack started a downfall. So then just a little crack can start reconstruction. And that's what I think we all have to appreciate. This is the lesson that she taught us, Jody. It was one little person who had so much going against her, not for her, against her. And through all odds said, no, I'll take it my way. She wasn't an easy camper. She didn't just go, okay, I love everything. I'm doing everything. She said, I have to take it slowly. I have to understand it. I'll take one step forward. Then Hashem will help me take another one and another one and another one, another, another one. And that's what she did. And I think we have to look at ourselves and say, we can do that too. Okay. Every one of us can do that too. We all are B'Tselem Elohim. We all have that Nishama that Jody had. Just have to, right? Go down deep and bring it out. It's all the same. We can do it. We can really, really do it. Okay. So when you're looking at these opposing forces, you have to realize that everything in this world can either bring you connection or separation. And what's so interesting when you think about it, it's the same thing. The same thing can. So in your marriage, you can become very connected or you become very, very distant. Even when you use your cell phone, like how many boobies are on the line here? Sandy. Okay. So Sandy Klish, perfect example, booby. Okay. So where does her Einik Lach live? Where is Sandy Klish's all her grandchildren living? Where are they living, Sandy? Israel. Yeah, they're all living Israel. In so how do you connect to them? I get them on a plane and I bring them here and I bring them to the airport. <laughs> Tonight, I picked them up at the airport tonight. Okay, and what other way when you can't do it that way? How else do you connect? I go visit them. Okay, you go visit them. Another way I picked the wrong I'm one. sorry. We okay. connect on, on WhatsApp. Oh, yes, good. on WhatsApp, on the cell phone, on this and on that. So it's so interesting. So that very cell phone could connect you a thousand miles away, right? It's incredible. Oh, it's incredible. And with the press of a button, and there you are, and you see these beautiful Einaklach. But that very same cell phone can disconnect you to the people who you love who are right in the room with you. Isn't that really fascinating? It's really fascinating. So I'm trying to show you, right? That power of opposing forces that are so great. And your job, this is what your job is over the next three weeks, you have time. We can't party so much. We can't have the music. We can't go to the weddings. We can't do all these things that are so distracting. Maybe it's important like to really self like introspect, right? You want to make a new world order. So we got to figure out how if things opposing me or pushing me or dissing me, what kind of choices am I making? How can I make things better? Okay. So I just think it's like, such incredible stuff. So let me just make sure that I am. The same thing with Yerushalayim. So sad. Yerushalayim is really Ir Shalom. That's what the words Yerushalayim mean. And Yerushalayim has such potential as a city and is meant, it was meant to bring peace to the world. Like everyone would come from all over the world to Shlomo Melech to get his wisdom to make peace. They would bring like sacrifices, 70 sacrifices to, to bring peace for the world for the 70 different nations. 
So Yerushalayim itself, it can have such potential, right? Or it could be such a divisive city, like really something to think about, okay? So now, okay. So when it comes to a break in the wall or a break in anything, like so many people who lives here in Thornhill, you know, do you ever see all these fences about the collapse? <laughs> There's so many fences in Thornhill that look like they're about to topple over. So what could the people who have owned those fences have done to prevent all that? What could they Maintain them in a good condition from day one. Okay, maintain them in a good condition from day one. Or if they saw a small crack. Fix it up. Fix it up before it becomes this huge issue. Do you know what I mean? And so that's something for us too. Like if you feel a break, right? You've got some kind of break, break in your happiness, a break in your this, a break in, don't wait till everything is completely destroyed before you start thinking about repairing it. So this also to me was a very good lesson. Okay, now let me see. Ah, so the Korban Tamid. So it talks about this Korban that I told you gave forgiveness that was given on a regular basis, okay? I can tell you this one is so hard for me and that's the word Tamid means consistency, okay? So this is another thing that we need to be thinking about. Like Judaism takes consistency. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? To be a good Jew, you need to be consistent. It's like day in and day out, do the same thing, do the same prayers. It's repetition. It's, it's repetitious. What's the problem with our world and consistency? things happen things not yeah it's not things and collapsing it, yeah there's things collapsing things there's things that and in it's our boring world, it's boring yeah, it's, it's not boring exciting. consistency we we are brought up on this idea like i know like i know how much it drives me crazy like i can't stand like the technology just doesn't stop like why can't we just stop and let me catch up a little okay <laughs> Why do we have to keep on changing and changing why does it have to always be new and better and better and new and this and that like so what is that? What's that all about? What is this new and better and better and better? Why does it have to not be consistent? Why can't it just stay in and out? Do what you're supposed to do. Do the next right thing. In and out. Do it with joy. Why is it that joy is only you throw it out and get a new thing? And then you throw that out and get a new thing. And then you throw that out and get a new thing, right? Distraction. Like you get a seven-year itch when you're married. Then when you're married, like, you know, people are shocked to hear anybody. Like, we're celebrating in our shul. These people were married for 60 years. Why was it such a big celebration to the same person okay, <laughs> for 60 years? Because what are you talking about? <laughs> like, who would stick with somebody for 60 years? Like, that is so crazy. But what's the reality of what Hashem wants from you? Just wants consistency. Like, just remember me every day. Like for a lot of you, I was thinking about it, like maybe for the next 30 days, a lot of people ask me, like, what should we do? I was saying to Hillim for Jody, I feel so bad. What should I do with the, what should I do about this? So I said, you know what? Say it. Except don't say it now for a Fuasha Talema. Say it now for a, an Aliyah for her Neshama. She still needs it. There's no difference. Like now that she's passed on, she actually can't open up anything by herself. So if you were given a Tehillim to say, and you want to remember Jody, you want to think of the good things that she did, you want to do something for her that's special, send her a care package, send her a love note. What's a care package and a love note, but a piece of Tehillim. Couldn't get a better one. Right? Ask Sheila Miller. Okay. <laughs> Lambert. I think, okay. I think even now, I think even now that's actually more important because of her children, because of yes. the situation. Beautiful. I see a lot of that's an even better way, Dubai. a more beautiful and way of looking at it. Extremely, I think it's very important to do that. Okay, thank you, Barb. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is very beautiful. So just like little things we said, start and make breaches and breaks and you stop being consistent. And eh, so I don't have to, you know, whatever, I made a bracha today, I need to make it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I, I rushed, uh, you know, whatever it is, I, I learned a little, so I missed the class, big deal. I don't have to do it every day. Like, can't I do a little bit of Netflix? Like, can I do other things? You know what I'm saying? So what's the story trying to tell you? You know, you gotta try, try to try, try, try to be consistent. Don't take on things that are too overwhelming. Take on things that like that's what we're saying it's all small steps so if you looked in this week's parsha so Pinchas ends up being the hero 
right? So Pinchas was this character who was kind of overlooked. He never got to be a Kohen and he didn't make a big deal about it. Still a height, nice and quiet. The Jewish people start doing, you know, immoral and uh, things which are like idol worship and adultery. And it's a very, you know, horrible thing. And Hashem is sending a plague and everything's going upside down. And then this Pinchas says, I'm going to put a stop to it. And it was like really something that he couldn't put a stop to. In fact, the Torah tells you it took 12 miracles for him to actually put a stop to it and to kill the perpetrators of the crime. So the rabbis ask if it took 12 miracles to, to, to kill these people, and, and now at the end he's rewarded, he becomes Elio a Navi, he becomes a Kohen. Why did Hashem reward him? It wasn't like he did anything really, it was Hashem's 12 miracles. So what's the Torah tell you? The one thing he did was he took one step. Isn't that a beautiful idea? He just took one step. That's all. So I, I, this was such a nice story that somebody said. So I was listening. Um, who was it? Rabbi Fari said this story. It was so nice. So he said like this, Rabbi Scheinemann, he was studying in Petach Tikva when he was a younger person. He was studying in Petach Tikva and he had this really big shaila, big question that he had to ask. And nobody in Petach Tikva, none of the rabbis there seemed to have a clear answer. So they told him, you know what? Be smart, get on a bus, go to Bnei Brak and go see the Chazan Ish, who was also the extremely, extremely greatest rabbi at that time. So he goes and he goes with a friend. Fine. So they come to the Chazan Ish, they ask him the question and he clarifies it on a dime. And this Rabbi Scheinman is so happy, can't believe it. Like, He's like, this was so worth the trip. Now, these are people who don't really have any money. So they're always going on buses. Okay, so now he has to get a bus from Bnei Brak back to Petach Tikva. What's the problem? The buses stopped running. It was late at night. <laughs> okay, So he goes, okay, nothing to worry about because in Israel, what do they do a lot? They hitchhike. Okay, so they use their thumbs. So he's like, yeah, okay. So he goes with his friend and they start walking along the road that you would have to take. And they're trying to hitchhike. And no muzzle. It's like no cars are coming. It's really dark. They're like, oh, what are we going to do? I guess if it takes all night, we're walking to Petach Tikva. Okay, so they start walking some more. And then they see these like flashing lights. So they go, oh, must be a car. And they start running. And they're so excited. And they get to this very open field. And it ends up, it's not a car. It's just a man holding a flashlight. And you know, like when you lift the flashlight up and down, so it looks like flashing lights. Okay. So they get closer, and who is it? It's the Panovitcher Rav. And they're asking this famous, like this amazing Panovitcher Rav. He hasn't built the yeshiva yet, but he was already a great guy. He was a survivor of the Holocaust, a great rabbi before the Holocaust, a great teacher before the Holocaust. And now he, they see him standing in the field with a flashlight. And they say, Rebbe, you know, uh, how can we help you? Like, you have a flashlight, you must have lost something. So he says, no, I, I didn't lose anything. So they go, so, uh, I mean, it's dark, it's late, flashlight, empty field, nobody here, uh, anything we could do for you? So he goes, I tell you, I've been thinking that why would Hashem let me survive the Holocaust? It must be he wants a yeshiva like we had before the Holocaust here in the land of Israel. So I was thinking this field right here would be great. <laughs> They're going what? And he goes, yeah, here, I'll take the flashlight. See, I show you. Over here is where I thought the shul would be. Here would be the room where the boys would be learning. Here would be where they could sleep. The only problem is I can't figure out where to put the dining room. So if you want to help me, why don't you walk around with me in the field and we'll look around with the flashlight where you think we should put the dining room. Could you imagine? So the two boys, like, they were being polite, but they thought he was what? Crazy. They mamish thought he was crazy. So they said, Rebbe, you know, we're so sorry. We're trying to get home, but, you know, we wish you a lot of Hatzlacha, and we're not sure where you would put a dining room. <laughs> and boom, right? and they left and whatever the story is, they got back, obviously. So fast forward a couple of years later, like a crazy story. A couple of years later, this Rabbi Scheinerman, he grew up and he comes back and he sees that this yeshiva is real. That the Panovich Rebbe built this incredible yeshiva. He can't believe it. And he goes over to the Panovich Rebbe and he says, I, I don't know if you remember me, but many years ago, 
um, I was hitchhiking with my friend to get home to Petr Tikva, and you happened to be in a field with a flashlight <laughs> and you were telling us that, you know, your dream was that you were going to build this yeshiva that I see here with my own eyes. And I want to ask you, Mechila, because I thought you were crazy. And I never believed that anybody could accomplish this in this field. So the Panavacha Rebbe said to him something very beautiful. He said, you know what? I don't want you to feel bad at all. Because in all honesty, you were right. I was crazy. I survived the Holocaust. I lost all my family. I lost all my Talmudim. I was standing in a field with a flashlight. So in all reality, you're right. I was crazy. But you know what? I believed in Hashem that he would help me. And I dreamed it into existence. And that's what happened. So it's very interesting. If you go back in time, you know, Hashem says to Abraham, I want you to walk the length and the breadth of Israel. Walk the entire land. Because one day I promise you, this will be your children's land. We're very lucky. Like Hashem allowed us to see the beginning of that story. Do you know what I mean? And if you would really think about it, people would say you were crazy, literally crazy to ever believe that these kinds of things could really happen. So I think like each and every one of us, we have to take the next couple of weeks and as down and as dark as they may seem, you have to realize that you can flip it. All the potential for all the negativity, right? all the breaches and all the this, so we can make cracks that are positive in all the negative attitude that we might have and all the fears that we may have. Because I can tell you this, the world could shake from here till tomorrow, but we will be here forever. And the way you're going to make it through is you're going to dream your existence. You dream yourself through this, right? And you hold on tight. And whatever will be, will be. That was Jody's reality. In the end, she realized the game wasn't going to end the way she really wanted it to. And she said, that's okay too. Because, right? We're not going to understand what good and bad is but we're going to give it over to Hashem who really knows it much better than us. And we're going to have that bitachon in that reality. Then as long as you played your role, you can't, that's your job. Our job is to play our role. That's all. We go home or we go, like we said, we, she loved that to Hillam. Hashem watches. He watched her going into this world and he watched her going out. She went out as a Jewish princess, a real person of loyalty. She really did. She really, really, really did. And in Mirza Hashem, we should all live long and healthy and wonderful lives to 120. And with our own eyes, see Mashiach. But if it doesn't happen that way, know that you went out with royalty. You played your part and you brought Mashiach that much closer. So everyone have a, a good end of this fast, a meaningful end to it, and a meaningful three weeks. And Emir Tzashem, we should always remember Jody Litova, and she should just, she's a Melitz Yasher up there for us. Believe me, she Amen. is advocating for every one of us. And she's advocating for the entire Jewish world and the world at large, okay? And we should merit to, to see the Mashiach it's so beautiful to see so many people. May Hashem Yisrael bless us all. Okay. 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 Before everybody goes. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. You know what? Let's it? say a Tehillim. And in fact, you know what? Let's do two things. Okay. So let's say a Tehillim for her. Thank you, um, Tatia, for saying that. Let's do 121. Let's say 121 as well. Which one? I can't hear you, sorry. No, I'm just saying, uh, Jody's parents are also sitting Shiva. They need yes. uh, everybody's support. They yes. did bring Jody to this world. They're very sore, and uh, I think it'll be nice, you know, for people to go and, and, and show their condolences to their parents and show what the Jewish people are able to do. 
Okay, perfect. And let me explain something. So the address is 274 Mullen. Okay, by accident, we wrote Milner. Okay, so that's a big accident. Okay, so 274 Mullen. Okay, and I think the Shiva times are from two to four and seven to nine. And, exactly. and Katya is right. Like her parents would so appreciate it. And so would Jody. Like Jody wanted her parents to see how much, you know, we all loved her and, yep. and, and loved them because you're right. They did bring her to the world. So I would love to do one to Halim and, and uh, turn off the recording. Gail. Yeah, I'm going to turn off the recording. Shoshana, if you could lead us, that would be amazing.